Uh, sir, I'll present like this, sir. It's okay. Present. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Uh, this is a case of a 52 year old male uh, who is a resident of Salem from Tamil Nadu, MSc graduate, teacher by occupation. Informant was patient self uh, and his wife, so the history was thus reliable. Patient was referred to our hospital on 21st of September after 10 days of admission at a nearby hospital. Uh, he presented to us with the chief complaints of yellowish discoloration of eyes and urine since 15 days, a history of abdominal distension since 7 days and uh, bilateral leg swelling since 5 days. History of abdominal pain since three days. Uh, coming to the history of presenting illness, patient was doing well before September 2021 when he noticed jaundice, which was insidious in onset. It was associated with nausea post prandelli and feeling of tiredness since three weeks. Patient initially noticed the high color urine and later noticed the yellowish discoloration of his eyes as well as skin. It was associated with mild generalized itching since two weeks. There was no history of any prodromal symptoms, including fever, chills, rash, arthralgia, vomiting. The jaundice was not associated with GI bleeds and the related symptoms of bleeding as like uh, giddiness or sweating. There was no history of any long-term drug intake or over-the-counter drug intake. There was no history of consumption of native or alternative medications. So, Shrividya, what are the possibilities? Mm -hmm. I'm the patient. Uh, just uh, tell what no. are the possibilities because it's 20 minutes. I'm called uh, suggestive of cholestatic jaundice, ma'am. Uh, because patient present with high colored urine. No, 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 no justification. So one is cholestatic jaundice. Yeah. Can mm -hmm. be intrahepatic or extrahepatic. And no, give a complete diagnosis. So there are a few things happening. Cholestatic jaundice. And then there is abdominal distension leading my leg. And there is an abdominal pain. Uh, Dr. Anabra, you want to expand on yes. the abdominal pain? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'll I'll come to it, ma'am. Ma'am, this is the uh, the expansion of history of itching, ma'am. Okay, it was also finish it, finish it, finish it. Finish okay, uh, ma'am. Uh, yes, the, uh, the itching was insidious in onset. It started in the palms and soles and later became generalized. It was mild in severity, more in the night time, and associated with disturbance in sleep. It, there was no associated CM eruptions and because there was short duration, patients, uh, patient did not notice any waxing or waning in the severity of this itch. It was not relieved with the topical medications prescribed during his last admission and it was associated with dryness of skin. Uh, coming to the abdominal distension, it, uh, it was present for seven days. It was subacute in onset, generalized, gradually progressive, associated with mild loss of appetite. Uh, it was later followed by the bilateral lower limb swelling since th two to three days after the onset of distension, which patient noticed initially in the ankle region. Uh, there was also a history of antecedent reduced uh, urine output noted before the onset of this abdominal distension. There was no associated facial puffiness or breathlessness on exertion, no associated breathlessness in the lying down position. This distension was not relieved with the passage of stool or flatus, and there was no aggravation noted after any food intake. Uh, coming to the history of abdominal pain, it was also present for past three days, mild to moderate in severity, gradual in onset, persistent deep dull aching in character lasting for 15 to 20 minutes, which subsided after some pain medication. This pain was located in the epigastric region, but not radiating to the other regions of abdomen. It was aggravated with food intake, but there was no definite relieving factors like uh, relief of pain in the forward position. It was not associated with vomiting, altered bowel habits. There was no history of trauma, awareness of abdominal lump, and the bladder habits were normal. Um, um, this is the complete mem presenting illness it's history. Finish of no significant nutritional yes, deficiency. Uh, no, there was no significant nutritional deficiency noted in the form of mem recurrent oral ulcers or uh, like dry or uh, night blindness or anything. With the, it was uh, patient had a, uh, af after the onset of all these symptoms had a restricted sternus activity, but he was able to do his mild daily activities. For the above mentioned complaints, patient was admitted in a nearby hospital and was uh, in view of his worsening of his symptoms as well as worsening of some lab parameters. Patient and his relatives were advised to visit a trans liver transplant facility for which patient got admitted to us on the 21st of September. Man. Uh, so, what's the age year. of the patient? Age of the patient? Uh, 42, ma'am. Okay, take over. Yes, Dr. Meiti? Yeah, regarding your personal habits, alcohol. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the patient had a. Uh, uh, so, this is the history of a last admission. 
a uh, patient uh, was admitted with similar complaints one year back when he was noted history of jaundice for 3 weeks which was also acute in onset and progressive but that time it was not associated with any itching or pale stools with no prodromal symptoms and the jaundice was preceded by uh, patient gives a history of clear binge alcohol consumption one week prior to the onset of this jaundice there was also history of pain abdomen for one week which was also located in the upper abdomen but not radiating a patient was not able to give the clear history regarding the other characteristic of that pain and there was also history of vomiting for 5 days which was acute onset not associated with any ugi bleeding and no distension or altered bowel habits uh, so coming to the present as a, a personal history patient was uh, uh, a known case of an alcohol use disorder since 15 years with the 3 to 4 units of whiskey per day which was equivalent to around 40 to 50 grams of alcohol per day last consumption was one year back prior to his last admission after that he denies any alcohol recent use of alcohol and there was binge drinking in the past noted the audit c score was calculated to be 7 and the cage score was 3 uh, otherwise that other than that sir no history of any smoking or tobacco chewing diet recall was okay Uh, ma'am, diet recall, ma'am. Uh, calorie deficit is eight hundred to thousand. Thousand. And protein deficit is sixty grams. Okay. Yes. That completes the history. Uh, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, only ma'am. Uh, 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 ma'am, beside then this time, only that uh, patient was uh, admitted that last time he was given some medications for which he took only for two months and then stopped all the medications himself after the improvement of his symptoms, ma'am. Okay. Yes, so one year ago there was only joint disc, no abdominal disc, yes, no pedal edema, nothing, no. Yes, yes, sir. That that the last episode joint was. Disc. Okay, so first year, one year ago joint disc which lasted for a, about a, one or two weeks and settled down. Prior uh, with the binge drinking. Now for the last, now the total duration of illness is how many how many weeks? Sir, uh, total duration for the main complaints he was telling for two weeks, but the tiredness and feeling of generalized fatigue liberty he was telling for around three weeks, sir. Okay, so total total three weeks. So three weeks. two weeks of uh, jaundice, uh, then abdominal distension, pedal edema, abdominal pain. Okay, fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay, three weeks. Three weeks. Yes, sir. Present uh, in the present uh, complaints, the patient is having cholestatic jaundice. So now what you do is now give a summary and give your differentials. He's told everything that you want. Anything else you want to ask, you ask him. Otherwise, give your everything is completed. No? So now give a good summary and what's your differentials. Okay, okay. Syndrome diagnosis. Fifty-two-year-old, fifty-two-year-old me uh, with a With the previous history of uh, uh, alcoholic hepatitis uh, in the past, now presented with the complaints of polycystic type of jaundice associated with the abdominal distension, uh, uh, probably due ascites, associated with the followed by pedal edema, and associated with the acute uh, decrease in urine output. Um, ियो um so this is um i think no you don't know the history you only know the uh, you are allowed to examine the patient okay sir uh, then patient has jaundice abdasitis pedal edema and uh, probably will consider as a um, chronic liver disease some form of decompensated pyrimal liver disease liver disease okay now depending upon the duration and the onset now we have to decide whether it is chronic Acute or acute or chronic, all those things we have to think. Okay. Now you have, now you have uh, committed that there is a decompensated pyrimidine liver disease. Okay. Now uh, that is how you build up, and then add on the history of cholestasis and abdominal pain. Then add on the uh, personal history of alcohol and see whether everything is okay. What the clue? Yes. Sir. 
Uh, okay. No, wait, let us summarize. Uh, One minute, let us do it. Try to summarize the history. Okay. So, uh, 52 year old patient who is a long case of chronic liver disease uh, with significant alcohol intake in the past. Because you said that one case of chronic liver disease. Because there was only a history of ginger alcohol. This prior to the alcohol was a jaundice which lasted for a week or two. That's all. Yes. We found that the patient had chronic liver disease. Because a uh, short history, and, you know. Yeah. You will also not know it is due to alcohol, no? Just one transient yeah. this history of history of anything. Yeah. Alcohol, history anything. alcohol history is there, alcohol history is there, but it could still be there. Okay. okay. So give your differential so that will be better. What's your what is your syndrome called differential diagnosis? Give your syndromic diagnosis. Uh, well, start in alcohol use disorder. Okay. Alcohol use disorder. Uh, start up. Start up. Okay. In the background, alcohol use disorder. Uh, no patient present is. Cholesterol disorder. Different diagnosis. Uh, our syndromic diagnosis. Don't tell the history again. Okay. Uh, alcoholic use disorder. Uh, cholesterol jaundice, Mainly, uh, probably intrahepatic cholestasis. Uh, first possibility is. Um, uh, acute on chronic liver disease with decompensation. No, there is a chronic liver disease, so alcohol use disorder, uh, acute, advanced, acute advanced, acute advanced chronic liver disease, as the, by the current definition, it is advanced chronic liver disease because there is decompensation with that polystatic decompensation. features. That's a syndromic. No, you're moving to a syndromic diagnosis with okay. epigastric with, pain with, that you'll have to discuss with a performance scale of. 0 to 1, performance case of 0 with no comorbidity and an absence of GI bleed. There is real insufficiency, so that is present, absence of GI bleed, hepatic overt in the hepatic enteropathy, many all the important negative ones. And now tell what is your diagnosis, that's your broad syndrome diagnosis. Now what are the positives? Okay, so yeah, that is the common set of chronic viring mm -hmm. disease with alcohol use disorder plus uh, polycystic and epigastric pain. Okay, now can this be, uh, it can be chronic pyring disease with the decompensation. It can also be ACLF. Is it, uh, is, ACLF. It, is, it, is it ALF? No, uh, sir. Uh, patient is, if, if you are considering it is a chronic pyring liver disease, it is ACLF. No, no, I am asking you a question. Can this be an ALF? Because patient has decompensated within four weeks of uh, the current present day, yes, no? Sir. Because this yes, is the first thing you ask. Patient has decompensated be... within a short period of onset of the current within nausea and fatigue. Only three weeks. So can this be ALF? Yes, sir. Your answer yes, will be from the history it doesn't look like because there is only uh, jaundice and pediatric. You should have other features. Only on physical examination and investigation you will be able to tell. Can this be ACLF? Uh, also, for ACLF, you have this uh, within four weeks patient should have a hepatic encephalopathy or uh, uh, say ascites is there, sir. So we can consider that. Yeah. is there, ascites is there, and if the if the INR is prolonged, uh, that will be enough, no? And yes, if there is subtle findings, findings and so that so only on physical examination lab test you'll be able to finally say. But there is an encephalopathy as such clinically. So we have to complete the physical examination and do lab test also to make a final assessment whether there is ALF or ACL. Okay. So, can, can there be a bottle vein thrombosis in this patient which has caused pain and uh, as chronic liver disease, bottle vein thrombosis, abdominal pain, and then the decompensation? Bottle so, vein thrombosis is a possible So, these are the things you know, like in, in a patient like this, you have to consider ACLF, you have to discuss ACLF, you have to discuss decompensated and advanced chronic liver disease, and you have to also discuss the presence possibility of a bottle vein thrombosis. Okay, okay, now, so India, supra, uh, how do you explain the abdominal pain? How do you explain the cholestasis? Yeah, that's what you How yeah. will you explain the cholestatic symptoms? How will you explain the abdominal pain? Now, discuss that aspect. Uh, abdominal pain, uh, in the ascites, there can be uh, infection. SBP is a reason for abdominal pain. No, no, no. This is epigastric pain, no? Just think, no? He's very. What, what has he said? He said epigastric pain related yes. to food intake and there is cholestasis. So, what are the possibilities? One is portal vein thrombosis. 
Chronic bronchitis, no? No, no, cholestasis, cholestasis. cholestasis. This patient yeah. does, no, so if they, whenever you have a patient with cholestasis, the mind should immediately decide whether it's extrapatic or intrapatic. The clues for extrapatic are pain. Abdominal pain. Okay, pain. pain. Then pain. features pain. of cholangitis pain. like fever. Pain. Okay, so, okay, so you have to make a decision whether this pain is of biliary in nature, which is responsible for the cholestasis, or is an unrelated pain. Okay, that is how your mind should work. Okay. So what do you think? The pain is epigastric pain aggravated by food intake, lasts for 15 to 20 minutes, require medication, and after that it passes off. It doesn't have a typical pancreatic pain, it doesn't have a diffuse pain, it doesn't have a volgate or a chronic pain, it's just diffuse upper abdominal pain. Okay, can this be due to hepatic uh, parenchymal extension or liver capsule? Usually it is lasting only. Okay. Underlying pain is like it's pain percent most of the time and is unrelated to food eating. Can this be biliary pain? Biliary pain is also, uh, it will wax and not lying by at least less than six hours it lasts for. How? how? Uh, just don't think of a chance alone because a person with a polycytic jaundice can have so many diseases. See, you can have cholangia carcinoma, we do not know. Understand? A cholangia carcinoma or a gallbladder carcinoma or a person can present with pain. Okay. But it's such a short history, so we will not consider it immediately. But don't think that every pain in abdomen in a cholestatic patient is due to stone only. So you have to keep your mind open. It can be pancreatic, it can be biliary, it can be gallbladder C, it can be uh, uh, cholangia carcinoma, many things. Okay. So you have to keep your mind open and then try to think. Okay, the pain is not typical of a biliary pain. I agree. It's not a typical of a biliary pain. Also not typical of pancreatic pain. Pancreatic so pain. There is some pain in the gastric. So I think we'll have to... So, so I think can any way explain the cholestasis? Now we have person who has decompensated. There is no doubt about it. And the patient has cholestasis. So what do you think? Is it a uh, sort of biliary cirrhosis sort of a thing? Or is it a cholestasis related to parenchymal liver disease itself? Cholestasis related to parenchymal liver disease. Though. Like what? Which cholestasis, uh, which disease produces cholestasis and parenchymal disease, which can decompensate within a short period of time? Primary biliary cirrhosis. No, in this particular entity, alcoholic hepatitis. Uh, oh, okay. Alcoholic hepatitis can also have a cholestatic component. Mm -hmm. And then it can decompensate very fast. Okay. So there is an acute component of alcoholic hepatitis. There may be a background disease. So they can present with acute hepatitis like acute cholestatic hepatitis like presentation. They can decompensate within a short period of time with ascites period edema. Okay. And they may even have altered sensorium also. And when you check there will be altered uh, coagulation profile also. So so if you consider alcoholic hepatitis, to some extent the cholestasis can be explained. All other etiologies you will find it very difficult. Of course, if, suppose you consider viral hepatitis. Suppose this can be viral hepatitis. Yeah. Is it possible? The history is not yeah. like an acute. It doesn't have no acute prodrome. Unless you consider that there is a background disease like a chronic hepatitis and this is a re reactivation which has produced the and then in a short period the patient decompensates it due to some other factors. Okay, but again a far fetched diagnosis. Can it be Wilson's disease? Portitude mm -hmm. year old? Yeah, can it be Wilson's disease? So therefore you can keep alcohol on one side and keep other differentiators on the other side because he's just in that 42 years age. He's not, I think he's 42 years. 52, 52. Ma'am, 52 months. Sorry, ma'am. 52. 52. Okay. Yeah, sorry. short history of cholesterol is followed by decommend session. Decom you have to keep your mind like that. And Alcohol in the. Okay. If it, if it fits in, okay, first diagnosis. But second, third, and differential diagnosis should be ready. And you must be able to uh, thrash out the DD and defend or uh, say that it is not likely. Okay. You must be bold enough to say, bring in and then say it is unlikely. That's the way it should be discussed. Okay. Anything else, ma'am? No, I think, yes, move on. So, okay. so, the, so your, if you, if you uh, give a, uh, uh, a near differential diagnosis, the first one will be alcohol use disorder, advanced chronic liver disease with features of cholestasis. And the cause of cholestasis can be intrapatic as part of alcohol-related hepatitis, associated hepatitis. There can be associated stone disease not present with cholangitis because the alcohol can cause uh, uh, hemolytic anemia and stone disease. And then... Since it's a gastric pain, just keep a possibility of chronic pancreatitis with the biliary with the stricture of the distal CBD. That would be the way I would consider. 
And of course, polystatic features due to viral hepatitis without rhodromal. Can it be autoimmune? Because there's some history, it keeps on talking of tiredness and weakness, you know, for three weeks. So keep autoimmune hepatitis with an overlap also is a possibility. So therefore, related to alcohol and not related to alcohol, have a wide Sivilya, there is an issue here. Okay. This patient is not taking alcohol for the last one year. So is it possible? Can you diagnose alcohol hepatitis then? No, sir. So as per the criteria, you can diagnose. Uh, yes, sir. Then you have to be very, very careful. If the picture, clinical picture is highly suggestive and acute alcoholic mm -hmm. uh, hepatitis and recommendation, the person may not be telling correct. He may be still drinking yes. or he may have had a binge drinking. Okay, and you may not have divulged to the family members. You may be going outside and drinking. Many people know very well to hide their habit of alcohol. So, in, if there is a strong prior history, there could be a recidivism, and the patient is not telling it. That is a possibility. Okay. So, that is why if you diagnose alcohol hepatitis straight away, you have to defend it by saying this. Otherwise, the person who is not taking alcohol for one year it will be difficult. Yes. Okay. One year is too difficult. Okay. When did he last take alcohol, Anabra? Um, ma'am, uh, before that, uh, that last admission, ma'am, which was one year back, ma'am. After that, After he that was... After that, he's not taken at all. Okay. okay. Uh, no, so that no, no, become no. difficult, no? So, so, in that context, then can it be hepatocellular carcinoma? Can it, can it be one of those? So he's not taken alcohol at all, and oh. suddenly there's weakness, tiredness, and then the patient has uh, 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 polystatic jaundice, and the patient has gone in for failure. I didn't get that history. I thought he had taken alcohol recently. So, can it can it be a granulomatous liver disease? These are the things you have to consider. Yes, I, I didn't yes, get that history right. I, I was not making a note of it. So, if there's no alcohol, you consider all of the possibilities other than alcohol causing a direct ACLF or alcohol causing hepatitis. Have you understood? Yes, so, then yes, the differentials will be whether a patient has an alcohol-related liver disease with a HCC, number one. Is it granulomatous hepatitis? Or is it autoimmune with overlap? These will come as your differentials. And in this context, the patient has to go for a liver cell failure, polyneal carcinoma will come up as a DD, hepatocellular carcinoma will come as a DD. All this because they, they behave like a subacute hepatic failure. They are the ones that behave, although the duration is within one month. But that is the presentation of some of the highlight polyneal carcinoma. With an lymphatic obstruction, they can present with ascites and decompensation. Okay, and, and, That's and why I asked you know, and, uh, So when you look at the patient, when you look at the patient, it's a decommendated liver disease. Okay, then you build up uh, our history. Okay, and there is a there could be a chronic parenchymal liver disease due to his prior alcoholism, but now something else has uh, changed that keeps the balance towards okay. decommendation. Can this be but carry syndrome and a short history, abdominal pain, ascites, fetal edema? Yes. But uh, this pain was uh, one more at least afterwards. That's it. You feel what pain? And like? John, this cholestasis also is uncommon. Uncommon, yeah, uncommon. That's so that way. So if you are asked questions like this, no, you have to, you must be able to defend. Say that's unlikely for due to the following reasons. Okay, that's the you have to say. Okay. Okay. More to examination. Uh, ma'am, on examination, patient was so what conscious. So, what was your working diagnosis at your center? Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, ma like you said, ma'am, all these possibilities were kept, ma'am, because the presentation was very atypical of both uh, alcoholic hepatitis as well as, ma'am, any uh, hep Yes, ma'am. So, yes, so, we have discussed yes, all, no? So, see, that's yes. how we discussed. See, we discussed all issues that you also concerned. Yes, ma'am. We didn't yes, know that this was there. But see, so, we discussed everything. everything yes, I think the most important thing was, I don't know how I missed, I was not noting down, that I, absence of alcohol for one year and a sudden onset of jaundice yes, to consider all of the possibilities. Rather than an alcohol associated hepatitis and ACL will not come as a DD at all in this patient. Okay? Yes. Okay, yes. let's move on. Uh, I'm coming to the examination, the uh, the important part of BI the normal. The uh, mm. uh, uh, the ictus was present, ma'am. Other than that, ma'am, I mean arterial pressure was 90. There was no bite out spot, no xanthal asthmas. Uh, um, the other examination all normal um, except for the gynecomastia was present neck examination was normal uh, patient had uh, scratch marks present with shiny nails but no petechial rashes there was no palmar arrhythmia dupuytens contracture uh, um, no other peripheral signs of cld and internal malignancy was not hepatocellular reflux uh, it was normal sir normal. Uh, yes, sir. it okay, was present so yes. thing much uh, this is the salient uh, features. Otherwise, we uh, yes, discuss the other pieces. Yes, ma'am. The uh, on inspection, ma'am. What the was the salient findings on abdomen examination? 
yes ma'am yes ma'am the ascites uh, ascites was present ma'am no visible veins were present ma'am uh, the liver uh, spleen is palpable uh, spleen was palpable ma'am but liver gall bladder was not palpable abdominal girth was 90 cm trop space dullness was there ma'am on percussion uh, liver sand was 10 cm other than that i'm auscultation and parietal examination all normal ma'am negative okay are the systems are normal Uh, other systems normal ma'am no flaps ma'am uh, mini mental status score was uh, 26 by 30 okay okay there uh, was uh, flaps were dull how did you assess uh, liver dull liver uh, liver span uh, sir uh, 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 because that uh, lower border of liver percussion was felt at the lower border of the costal margin the mid clavicular line sir so we assume that uh, because no, no, the dullness is in if, if there is significant ascites including flanks are completely dull uh, how easily we can assess the extent of uh, liver the lower part uh, but so it was less than that means there was not much of ascites when you examined okay. so deep uh, pal- deep uh, palpation was also uh, like no, no you initially uh, said liver is not palpable enough. so we are not able to assess the lower border the only way is to do percussion by percussion you have already committed that the planks are dull there is significant ascites so see this is how you will land into trouble examiner will be sharp and pounce upon you you know uh, so you have to be very careful unless you have uh, changed the position of the patient when there is significant ascites one may not get enough resonant area to assess the lower border of liver on percussion okay so you must be yes, careful sir. when you yes, say sir. like that. okay yes Any veins? So, sir, abdominal veins? Uh, no, no abdominal veins, ma'am. No back veins. No uh, abdominal veins, ma'am. Present. No veins. Okay. So, Diti, what? Any? Now, what's your diagnosis? I think only physical finding a pedal edema is there. Right? Is it there? Spleen is there? What is there? So, what's your diagnosis now? Decompensated cirrhosis, ma'am. Cirrhosis with bone retention. So, possibly it's got simple decompensation. The decompensation, and you still cannot. Uh, We still cannot uh, 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 discuss about the cause for the polystatic jaundice. So now, what will be your differentials? Then gallbladder is not palpable. What are the possibilities now? It will be the same. It's CC, granulomatous diseases, autoimmune, and all of them are again presenting as portal retention. You agree to that? I think that that's how you have to discuss. No, yes, yes, so, gallbladder was palpable; it could have been helpful. But if it's hilar pharyngeal again, you're not able to palpate. There is something has happened on an underlying chronic liver disease, cirrhosis with portal hypertension. So I think my bet would be whether it's gallbladder or because the uh, jaundice uh, jaundice occurred uh, within a short period of uh, decompensation and polystasis. Should we consider uh, really mechanical obstruction because decompensation even occurred very fast. So the pyramidal disease with the significant decompensation is the dominant component. Yeah. The cholestasis. Otherwise, it will be difficult to explain. And if it is an biliary obstruction, it will be too difficult to explain the decompensation within such a short period. Maybe two three months later, one could have explained the selling secondary yes. biliary cirrhosis. But now within this short period, it will be too difficult to bring in the cholestasis. The uh, the other thing is just keep IgG four. Age related cholangiopathy. Keep all these as your differentials. You know where the person has an underlying chronic liver disease. On on top of that, there is some uh, polystatic features. Okay, okay. it's just for discussion sake, so that you don't miss on this. All see the thing is the wider differentials you have with the etiology. Somewhere down the line, the investigations will pop up. All right. All right. Yes, ma'am. Can we move on to ma'am, the investigation? Because of the ma'am, because of the uh, presence of the hepatocellular reflex, we just kept out the uh, acute but cherry as the diagnosis. Other yeah. than that, ma'am, what you yeah. told, ma'am, we can, we continued it. Um, the, and these were the investigations. Okay, one, well, we don't go to this. Just no. one second. Okay. What investigation do you want to do? Just tell us important investigations. Just what is it that you missed out? Total count. Total count throughout any infection. No, no. So you need a CBC. You need a CBC with a perfusion. You will need an IA now. One just missed out. Just missed. Cellular function test, renal renal function test, mm-hmm. viral markers. Viral markers, yes. Then AFP, AFP, alpha feta. Alpha feta roti. Okay, then what else? Ammonia. You will need a serum ammonia. No, you will need a serum ammonia. Okay, and the autoimmune to rule out autoimmune etiology. So based on the uh, AG, and ask for a serum IgG. 
we can don't ask for all the markers right in the beginning. It just be a huge cost to the patient. And I think level one. What will be a level one investigation in this patient? Level one investigation. What will be a level one investigation? Two investigations are allowed. What are the two important investigations you do? Ultrasound. To quickly decide what are you doing? Ultrasound. The doctor study would be level one. And a liver biochemistry. I think this would be a level one investigation. This is how they ask in the exam, no? Because once you've sorted out the liver biochemistry, the ultrasound, then you know where you're going ahead. Okay. Okay. So can we have that information? Uh, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, these were the investigations when patient was admitted at the outside hospital. Let's just summarize. Let's just summarize. Uh, it was a uh, 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 conjugated hyperbilirubinia with a total bilirubin of 21, direct component 15. Uh, OTPT were ma'am uh, 10498 and ALP was, that was last year, no? Uh, ma'am, so this hospital. Ma'am, this this then this time also he was admitted, ma'am, and he was told that your uh, your symptoms are not improving and your lab parameters are worsening, so you get transferred to a liver transplant. You might require ma'am. That's what. Yeah, this admission was in September, no? Yes, yes. So you are showing the details of that. Admission uh, in September when the yes, sir. Started. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, so the R factor was 1.4, sir, and uh, LOHG reversal was there, sir, with the mild uh, AKI, a uh, creatinine of 1.6. Other than that, sir, um, all were negative. Um, viral serology, COVID, okay. everything was normal. What is the I um, uh, Yes, sir. L L plant phosphatase was 198, ma'am. Uh, and no, GGT no, normal, ma'am. No. GGT okay. normal. Yes, sir. Uh, ma'am, they uh, as he was uh, seen by a gastroenterologist outside, ma'am, they evaluated, ma'am, uh, for uh, this ANA. So, what do you mean, markers uh, are negative? Uh, negative, ma'am. IgG, IgG negative. was normal. IgG4, ma'am, was also, ma'am, uh, in uh, not at the higher range of, ma'am, for IgG4 okay. related cholangitis. Okay. AFP, normal, ma'am. <laughs> Uh, upper GI endoscopy was done, it showed only a, a, a small esophageal virus and no fundal virus. Mm. Uh, other than that, you and no cast and uh, uh, no pus cells. Uh, yes, 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 this was the endoscopy done outside hospital. Uh, okay. so they, also a, yes, sir, yes, sir. they also did a CT, CT plane uh, because mm -hmm. of the AKI, which showed a cirrhosis of liver, splenomegaly. And a dilated lino renal collaterals and a distended GB with mild to moderate ascites. Mm -hmm. uh, they further went ahead and uh, did an MRCP, which also was not conclusive of any extra hepatic biliary obstruction. It showed a splenomegaly, multiple collaterals with moderate ascites. So, for the uh, last time, this, this admission only. Current, 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 current admission. Current. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, ma'am, when he came to our hospital, ma'am, similar findings, uh, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, AST, ALT, mild race, ma'am, less than five times the upper limit of normal, ALB was 213, uh, INR was 1.51, and he had a worsening of his AKI with creatinine now 1.9. Uh, other than that, ma'am, while markers were again repeated, it was all negative, ma'am. Uh, the, uh, because of his uh, worsening AKI, we did an, initially we did an ultrasound abdomen. It showed a chronic thrombus in the main portal vein and the right and left branches of the portal vein with shrunken liver, coarse echo texture, mild phenomegaly with mild to moderate free fluid noted. And this was the cut section of the portal vein showing, uh, showing a uh, echogenic thrombus inside the main portal vein extending into the branches. Sure. Mm -hmm. Chronic. Okay. Uh, okay. The endoscopy was done, ma'am. It revealed uh, no more. Uh, findings except for the small viruses and mild portal hypertensive gastropathy. When patient had a worsening in his uh, 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 blood parameters and the clinical features in our hospital also, bilirubin worsened from 23 to 25 uh, with direct component from 17. Uh, enzymes was also around 470 and 220, ALP rising and INR static at 1.51 and uh, 1.6. Uh, the male score was 31 and uh, CTP 9. When patient was uh, taken up for um, uh, work up for the uh, living donor liver transplantation for which his wife was ready. Uh, and then he was evaluated as the no other cause of uh, his so cholestatic. So we are not able to explain yes, cholestatic, yes. no? Can it, yes, be, can it be that the patient has got a portal cavernometrous cholangiopathy because there's portal vein thrombosis? Yes. That's something uh, that we did not discuss. One minute. That's yes, something we did not discuss. Yes. So I think in all patients who have polystatic, just keep that in mind. Polydocal plexus yes, can present as, although it's not confirming in this patient, but keep that in mind. MRCP yes. was normal. 
Yes, sir. MRCP mm-hmm. was not suggestive of ma'am any uh, collateral surrounding. Agree, agree. Yes, but sir. what I'm saying is, for discussion's sake, yes, there are so many things yes, in a patient with chronic liver disease. Just keep apart from the intrahepatic cases uh, causes we discussed. We discussed extrahepatic causes, but keep PCC also as a differential. Keep PCC also as a differential because he has he he has collaterals all over. Nothing prevents him from yes, having yes. polydopaplexis and having a mild type of an EHPVO. Okay, in the most yes. common cases, collegiopathy. So, uh, yes, so what should be the management be? You know. So the management should be. So we are not able to get a diagnosis. Do you think liver biopsy is indicated in this patient? They're not. We do not know because alpha is still high. Gamma GT is no, gamma GT is not. You said. It was not gamma GT. So alpha. So what are the causes of alpha elevation of gamma GT? Quickly, quickly. What are the causes of raised alpha and the normal gamma GT? In uh, uh, CLD patients, uh, due to bone. What are the sources of alkaline hospitals? That's true. Bone. What are the sources? Trivia. Bone, placenta. Mm. Then bone, placenta, leukocyte, enterocyte, mm-hmm. and the biliary system. All these there are five sites. So what you do is this is again a viable question. You ask isoenzyme of alkaline hospitals. Ideal is gamma G or five prime nucleotidase. If five prime nucleotidase and alpha is elevated, it is it is a biliary origin. Or if uh, gamma G and alpha is elevated, again it is biliary origin. But in case it's isolated, you have actually checked for whether it's arising from the bone. Ask for a calcium. Ask for ask for other causes whether the person has got a osteopenia. Therefore, alpha alone is coming from the bone. So that is since gamma G is normal. Therefore, the cholestasis picture I think. Um, there was a big hype on that history, and therefore we were moving towards polystasis. But discussion has to go on in the way that we discussed. Okay, and I think um, now do you think he's a candidate? Do you want liver biopsy? Do you want to do serum ACE in this patient? Even for sarcoidosis, gamma GT will be elevated. Yes. So that again is not there. All randomized disorders will have rise in alpha and gamma GT. Do you want a liver biopsy before going in for liver transplant? Yes. Why do you want to liver biopsy? Is it going to change your management? You have to First speak. Come come. If you don't speak, yeah, if you don't. You have to start speaking and we ask the question. Just start talking. Yeah. Cause for decomposition is not known. Yeah. So to love the etiology. No, no, no. Here's a patient who's a male. Is how much now? I'm thirty-one, ma'am. Thirty-one male, thirty-one male patient in liver cell failure. Would you would you want to do liver biopsy? Just proceed for a liver transplant. Then the wife is available, a donor is available. What will you do? Proceed for a liver transplant. Hmm? Liver transplant. Dr. Vijay, what is your suggestion? Yeah, I think in this patient uh, the. There is one particular issue. This uh, quadrant thrombosis was not there in the CT than the previous hospital. I think it was done within a period of one month. No, so uh, sir, uh, actually, sorry to interrupt, sir. That CT was actually plain CT, sir. Okay. So they were not. Uh, they had some distended uh, portal veins, sir, eight mm, uh, mildly distended. But so they also suggested a contrast study to rule out thrombosis of portal veins. They didn't do an ultrasound at that time. Uh, Uh, they didn't do ultrasound outside, sir. Uh, we did an ultrasound. It showed a thrombus in the main portal. Vein. Okay. So there is no doubt that this patient has the portal vein thrombosis. We should have prepared for the decompensation. But it is unusual for a, a portal vein thrombosis to present with such severe uh, deep jaundice and cholestasis. So that is a little uh, red herring in this case. So I yeah. think there must be an additional cause for the uh, decompensation. And in, as the patient decompensated, the portal vein also could have thrombus. That is what I feel. Because such severe jaundice reaching up to 51 level. What was the yeah. bilirubin level under 51? No. Such is uh, 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 extremely high bilirubin uh, 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 very unusual for portal vein thrombosis. That is the, what is one thing which I want to say. So I feel there must have been an additional cause, an unknown cause for that uh, 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 triggering of decompensation. But the patient has a classic ACL picture, and it is uh, decompensated. And uh, I think the patient, if he prolongs it further, the patient may die. So we have to consider liver transplantation.
Exactly. I think he's a candidate for liver transplant. Other thing is mm -hmm. non-disclosure of alcohol. No? That is something you have to keep in mind. You have to keep that in mind. No, but but DDT in the case is normal, so I think MCB that is probably normal. unlikely. MCB? So something is. Mm -hmm. MCB? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Ye
uh, presenting as an ACLF with the uh, altered mentation and uh, sudden decompensation in the form of ascites uh, happening in the post peripartum period, ma'am, just two days after the delivery. Uh, or it can be a viral hepatitis, ma'am, like a, a hepatitis B, which is after a pregnancy, which is having a flare up. Uh, viral hepatitis B having a flare up, uh, ma'am. Or it can what be a. What do you mean the presentation of ALP? <clears throat> Uh, How would you discuss this case? You discuss the case as related to pregnancy and not related to yeah, pregnancy. Yeah, First, to classify pregnancy. that. So, okay. related to pregnancy, now the question will be How does AFLP present? What percentage of patients uh, will have postpartum AFLP? Ma'am, around 30 to 40 percent will have a no, direct. That's very high. Not, not postpartum, not for the first time presenting in the postpartum after two days. Typically, there are very severe acute abdominal pain, no? The right hypochondrium. Yes. And then they'll have the features of uh, sight is usually not a feature, but they'll have an acute large liver and a tender liver. Okay. So what are the positives? So one is you think it's AFLP. Number two, more yeah, common. Yeah. Ma'am, it can. Uh, Ma'am, unrelated to pregnancy, no, 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 it no, can be an acute. Related to pregnancy, hang on. Oh. What are the other possibilities? Ah, uh, yes, uh, Ma'am, hepatitis E also can have a. Uh, There's no yeah, here. Yes, uh, Ma'am, it can be a help syndrome, ma which is having a postpart peripartum presentation. Uh, with the um, uh, sudden uh, uh, keep, keep the necrotic skin lesion in the left lower extremity in mind keep the IVF in mind keep the twin babies uh, in mind what are the other what can it be a prothrombotic state um, um, DIC uh, uh, disseminated intra, uh, intravascular coagulation DIC can also be uh, can, uh, can postpartum be a, a, a prothrombotic state Right away. Like, can no, you get thrombosis in no, the pelvic veins, leg veins, uh, uh, bottle vein, mesenteric vein, hepatic vein? Okay. So postpartum is, yeah, postpartum is a prothrombotic phase. You don't have to have DIC. Without that, yeah. we can. Yeah. So you have to keep Bacchiari as an important differential. Okay. We have seen quite a few cases presenting as acute liver failure. AFLP would not okay. consider. Okay, so this is one asset. Now, unrelated to pregnancy, what are the possibilities? Uh, ma'am, it can be an acute viral hepatitis B, which in the uh, postpartum stage having a flare, uh, with having uh, differential. No, no jaundice. Uh, there is no, no jaundice for this patient. So without jaundice, a person presenting with abdominal distension or cancer is typical. No. Post surgery, so patient is presenting after surgery, so only complications related to surgery, such as. What what complication can occur after LSCS? No, just post LSCS. And the patient develops ascites. What are the hospitals? Sri Vidya, you said something surgery. Now, can you just expand on that post surgical? Wound infection. Wound infection, yes. Okay. But it's only two days, 48 hours. The leak. What else can happen? What are the that causes of ascites? Okay, just let us say what are the causes of ascites. Just classify ascites. Uh, can you do a cardiac can, cause? Can, can, this be, uh, can this be hemoperitoneum? Hemoperitoneum. This lady has surgery. Hemoperitoneum can occur in the postpartum phase. Uh, uh, leak can occur from the uh, LCS site. Okay. Okay, so it can be hemoperitoneum due to some other day. Even eclampsia, if there is, it is there, a rupture of liver is well known to produce hemoperitoneum and patient can have ascites. No? So all this can produce. We don't have to jump and say that it is fluid. It can be blood as well. Okay. So if you classify ascites, we classify it as liver related and non liver related. Okay. So liver related would be 65%. Okay. Post surgical, what are the other possibilities? Post surgical, what are the possibilities? Uh, AFLP, then you consider hemoperitoneum, it's a rupture, and it can be Bhatkiari syndrome, that will be liver related. Non liver related will be again tuberculosis, malignancy, unlikely in this patient. Okay. But what are the other fluids you can get? You can get a bile, you can get a chylus fluid, you can get uh, blood, you can get a urinary ascites. We have seen patients post DNC having urinary ascites due to the trauma of the ureter because ureter comes in close proximity to the anatomical vault of the cervix. So we have seen urinary ascites. So bile, chyle, blood, urine. What is an elective or emergency surgery? What is an LSCS elective or emergency? 
it was an emergency surgery emergency so with the twins there could be sort of head impacted in the pelvic outlet and some necrosis of the urinary musculature can occur so urinary bladder trauma trauma and then urinary acid can easily occur that's the situation yeah so so it is called based on the color can a bile guide blood urine pancreatic ascites others are eosinophilic myxedema and nephrogenic just keep all these in mind so whatever is your ascites has to fit into one of these Okay. okay next slide let's move on next slide so what should you do now just hold on what should you do uh, what, the, uh, to what, one, what, one of investi- what one investigation you will do in this patient one or two um, uh, ultrasound abdomen ultrasound abdomen that shows moderate ascites uh, and if coagulation parameters are normal ascitic fluid analysis ma'am no? Uh, uh, supposing the INR is 2.9, would you not do a acetic fluid analysis? Uh, I'm, I'm, yes, These are the uh, questions that they ask. Now, don't say you're going to correct the um, INR and then do the acetic fluid analysis. So, for minimal invasive procedures, you don't need INR. Is not. If at all you're worried, then you do a take, and then based on that, you decide. Okay. Yes, so the so yes, the basically the hemogram at the onset was showed a leukocytosis. Okay, INR was 1.65. other all the other parameters biochemical was normal amylase was 109 lipase was normal and the pcr that is the protein creatinine ratio was slightly on higher side next slide next slide next slide this move on so go to the previous slide go to the previous slide go to the, yeah so acetic fluid analysis what is what, what you see is the then the bisleri bottle This is what we saw when we went to check uh, the ground. What is it? Uh, oh, destroy the fluid. It's not hemoperitoneum. It's a straw color. Destroy the fluid. It's not straw color. It's turbid, no? It's turbid. Is this the type of fluid you get in a cirrhotic patient? Uh, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. This is, this more, is only uh, a pus, no? It is a turbid fluid. So what will be, what will be, uh, what, what investigations will you do for this fluid? Uh, ma'am, the culture, ma'am, the acidic fluid culture, and first, uh, what will you do, doctor? Will you go straight for culture? What will you uh, do for? No, ma'am. Uh, neutrophil uh, count, ma'am. Neutrophil. Ah, uh, see, the look at the neutrophil count. Neutrophil count is nine nine point seven percent. Yes. Okay. Amylase lipase is normal, and your SAG SAG in a patient with a low protein, you cannot know the effectiveness of SAG. So SAG actually, the case was referred to us as spontaneous bacterial arthritis, but. When we saw this fluid by the side of the bed, it was just one diagnosis. So, what will be the next investigation? Ah, uh, ma'am, uh, CCT abdomen. So, what are the what are the no one minute? So, what are the causes of this type of a fluid in the peritoneal cavity? It can be um, it can be bacterial peritonitis by the uh, ma'am yeah, perforation of a exactly. bowel. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. Bowel. So, what could have happened? So, what do you think could have happened during surgery? Uh, ma'am, during a surgery, ma'am, there could be a bowel rupture or bowel injury, ma'am, which yeah. could have led to the. Uh, exactly. Both ascites as well as yeah. so that that's that's what was happening. So most probably yes, there was a rent either in the uterus or there was it was a twin pregnancy. So we do not know whether there was a rupture of the uterus itself and whether because they did it, they, it was a precious baby, you know. So they they went with an emergency. So whether there was a rent in the in the uh, what's it called the intestine small small bubble maybe it has come ahead in front of the uterus. And in a hurry, they could have done. So that is what that is first thing that should cross your mind that this is probably second. So how do you diagnose secondary bacterial peritonitis? Uh, ma'am, in a uh, case how of a CC, no. How will you uh, make a diagnosis of secondary bacterial ma'am, peritonitis? Ma'am, E. coli. Ma'am, E. coli. Ma'am, with the uh, very high bacterial count. Uh, Just one answer. Polymicrobial. Oh, polymicrobial. That's all. E. coli is the in most your... common for SPP also, no? Yes, yes. Respiratory yeah. or polymicrobial. polymicrobial. So, Multiple organisms culture. That is the clue. Hmm. Polymicrobial. That is polymicrobial. That's the only answer. No. So if you have a polymicrobial with a leukocytosis, it is a puff. It is arising from the gut. Okay. Next slide. So they did do a C. So the blood culture was this, and we thought, you know, just remember this with IVF. What we find is the progesterone levels are very high, and most of the IVF patients. They they continue to remain on progesterone for a longer period of time, so we have noticed this, and therefore it becomes a more of a prothrombotic state. 
So we thought of a growth thrombotic state as we have seen the case. So I thought whether that fasciitis that the patient had was probably some sort of a vasculitis or growth thrombotic state. She required debridement for that. That was already being done. Okay. And then when we did the acid fluid culture with the Trepsilna, Ascultobacter bohani, and Entrocopis fecalis. Three, three okay. so, that, so that clinched the diagnosis. So what should you do next? Next um, slide. No. Next slide. So they did a CT. Why would you do a CT? Ma'am, to ascertain the site of perforation, ma'am. Or... Is it possible patient is very really sick, mentally obtunded? So it was just to see whether any free fluid, no, very free, free air in the retronial cavity. It was just for that. And since there was some suggestion of a pancreatic pathology, so CT was done, nothing much was available. But what they found was diffuse haziness of peritoneal cavity with extensive fat stranding. Fact. So what should you do? This is the case that was referred to us for consultation. What should you now do? Uh, ma'am, initially, ma'am, uh, the... What would uh, you do now? What would you do? The uh, patient is there in the ICU, and this is the report that we have in hand. What would you do? Ma'am, for stabilization of the parameters, ma'am, vitals, uh, by so giving... See, that is all that you will do, but what would you do as an emergency? Uh, ma'am, uh, uh, laparotomy, ma'am, uh, to look for the... Uh, laparotomy, laparotomy or laparotomy or, uh, or lapar a peritoneal lavage. Lavage. Yes, lavage. So in CMC, when we, I was in my DM, we used to do lavage in the ward. We never had laparotomy, laparotomy and all that. So the ICU people, what they were doing, they were draining. The most important is drain the fluid. It is pus filled fluid. So what one good thing they did was they kept on draining three liters, four liters. So what should you call? You should call the surgeon and ask him to open up. No? Yes. So laparostomy, leave, leave it open or do a laparotomy, do a good peritoneal launch. So we suggested do a good peritoneal launch and see what is exactly happening at the and during surgery. And lo and behold, they found there was a rent in the in the small intestine and there was also a tear in the uterus. So what we thought clinically was there in this particular patient. You understood? Yes, so this is a bedside clinic, you know, if you have, the thing is, when you get a case like this, first thing is to see the drain. Once you see the drain, look for the culture, uh, look for the uh, counts. Once you got the counts, polymicrobial, open up. I did do a lavage in the patient settings. The patient was put on high antibiotic, but, uh, but the patient uh, required a surgery because she was mentally obtunded. She was a young person, 23 year old. So they opened up and the patient did well and she recovered and went back home. Okay. Okay, next case. Is there a need for prothrombotic workup? We just thought of it, but I think we are yes. just observing her. Okay. Because of the patient. Okay. And whether you give PT, 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 for... few key points of that case. Yeah, yeah, next case. Okay, next case. Okay. Sri Vidya. Hmm. A 54 year old lady on follow up for transaminitis had a recent right knee replacement a month ago was on analgesics present presented with sudden onset of abdominal pain localized to the epigastrium with the radiation to back one day uh, hold on what are you what are you okay next slide okay. answer these questions what are the possibilities uh, the patient is having knee joint pain with transaminitis, and but on a long term uh, analgesics. Analgesics, okay, agree. Uh, what is the current problem? Severe pain, abdominal pain, epigastric pain. Localized epigastrium, the radiation to the back one day. So, what are the possibilities? Uh, one is uh, pain can be epigastrium, so it's pancreatic origin or from the world, okay. peptic ulcer or deodorant ulcer. Peptic ulcer, urinal ulcer in this patient. Ulcer will produce uh, acute radiating to back. Peptic ulcer. Yeah, okay, it can present acutely with perforation. It can present acutely with GA bleed. But it can it, uh, severe pain acute. Um, maybe very rare, but uh, not the usual thing. Mm -hmm. Usual thing is uh, recurrent episodes of abdominal pain. And then pain doesn't settle down. That will boring pain towards the back side. That shows posterior penetration of a urinal ulcer. Okay, that's the good point. Okay, after some time only this happens, not on day one. So, what are the other possibilities? What, else? Uh, what are the other possibilities? Sudden onset. Sudden onset. Uh, Oligolithiasis can be one possibility. Stones, which. Oligolithiasis. A 54 year old lady with. Oligolithiasis? How do you know it's oligolithiasis? 
Polylithiasis. Polylithiasis. What's the mechanism of pain in polylithiasis? A polycystitis is there then only acute polycystitis. Why should polycystitis present as acute? Be very specific. How does a gallbladder stone present as a severe acute abdominal pain? Or oh, simply what is the mechanism, mechanism of the biliary pain? Mechanism. How does somebody get biliary pain? Can you just say how stone coming? If stone coming down the bile duct, then most of the time stone does not come at all. Most of the time it is stuck at the neck and then increases the tension inside the gallbladder and the tension increases. By that time it will slip back and that is why in about five to six hours time the pain settles down. Okay. Sometimes it will pass down. Okay. That also can produce pain. And, so, and even if it produces, even if it passes down, it can produce pancreatitis temporarily at least when it just gets stuck. Sometimes the stone may get stuck at the lower end or somewhere in the middle. It can produce either pancreatitis or a biliary obstruction. Okay. So, this is, this is, this is. so what's the difference between a what's the difference between a ureteric colic and a ball, ball stone colic? Uh, they ask you to draw a graph, you know. In the exam, they'll ask you to draw a graph. So just describe, just differentiate ureteric colic from a ball stone colic. Uh, is biliary colic, colic, uh, colic a misnomer or it's a true colic? Yes, ma'am. Biliary colic is a misnomer. Why? Why? Why is it a misnomer? Uh, uh, you just uh, describe the pain of a biliary pain and then describe the pain of a ureteric pain. You know the difference? Yeah, you will know. You will know the difference. Describe. Ureteric pain is a class. Describe ureteric colic. Well, biliary pain by is due to distress of the blood. So it is a steady, severe pain. That's the difference. So, biliary colic is misnomer. You are near test book. Okay. It's not classic colic. Like in the classic colic, you get in a small intestinal problem. You get crummy pain, and as the pain becomes severe, it again rains off. Then, after a couple of minutes, it will again become worse. And that's a classic a small intestinal pain, crummy abdominal pain. Okay. You can get similar pain for uh, uretic pain, but that pain is unusual for a biliary disease. Biliary disease is severe pain. Maybe felt in the epigastrium or right hypochondrium, and it lasts usually for about uh, maximum for about six hours, and then settles down or it gets complicated. If it doesn't settle down, then inflammation settles down in the whole bladder wall, and then bacteria will uh, start acting and acute polycystitis will set in. Okay. So the typical urinary colic is a rising pain and it touches the baseline. Mm -hmm. And there will be a sharp acute pain, sudden onset, settles down, and then the patient is symptom free, only to get the next pain after one or two days. Whereas in a gallbladder colic, the patient will have an insidious onset. It will remain for four to six hours, but when it comes down, it will never touch the baseline. There will be one dull ache that is persisting. Either it settles down after one or two days, or the patient may have a second second colic. Okay, so the misnomer is that it does not touch the baseline. If the pain touches the baseline in X and Y axis, then you find, then you will say that the patient is having a colic. You must know the graphic representation of a biliary colic and a ureteric colic. Okay, this is something that's asked. So what should you do now? So what do you think it is? Next slide. Mm -hmm. What should you do now? Patient, patient got admitted yesterday. Is yesterday's case. What should I do? On clinical examination, look for uh, local tenderness. What What is it called? Look for jaundice. What is that sign? Uh, look yeah, for look jaundice. For, yeah. mm -hmm. This sign. What is that sign? Yes, what is the sign? The particular, what particular sign you are looking for? In the abdomen. Uh, 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 Murphy uh, sign. What is the sign? Describe Murphy sign. What exactly you are going to do? Just tell and me. What is, what and what is Murphy's sign. point? What is Murphy's point and what is Murphy's sign? Uh, uh, lower causal margin and uh, uh, twelfth rib, uh, rib band, lower causal um, between the twelfth rib band. Sudden respiratory catch. No, no. What is the point? What is the Murphy's? What is the surface marking of Murphy's point? Alabra. Lower uh, so one is one is you draw a line from the left anterior superior leg spine and crosses the yes. ninth costal cartilage. That's one. 
The second one is at the intersection of the right rectus abdominal muscle with the intercostal cartilage. That is the Murphy's mm -hmm. point. So what are you looking for? How, how do you for Murphy's tenderness? The wall bladder tenderness. No, no. Just tell you know what. Wincing. Oh, oh, the inspiration, the patient will wince of pain. Yeah. I think yes. deep tissue knowledge exactly. is an inspiratory catch. It is not that you go and poke your finger and produce tenderness. That is not Murphy's sign. Murphy's sign is typically an inspiratory catch felt in the Murphy's point in the patient with acute polycystics. Okay. So I think basics has to be extremely clear. I think all of you have to read your uh, Bailey and Love and make sure that uh, the basics are thorough. Basics are thorough. Okay. Okay. Be very careful about that. So you look for jaundice and this patient was on ultrasound for quite some time, but that was the other differential, whether it was NSA related. So we did ask, there was no history of any NSAs. Okay. So how will you investigate this patient? Level one, level two? Uh, level and why? And why? True investigation again. Uh, I'm, I mainly had pancreatic enzymes, you are seeing LFT and liver and pancreatic enzymes and ultrasound of mm -hmm. them. So what are you looking for an ultrasound of the abdomen? Uh, the inheritance of uh, thorns, polystyes. Mm, what else do you look for? Pancreas. What did you look for pancreas? Edimized pancreas we can see. How often can you pick up images pancreas in a patient with acute pancreatitis or patient with constant pancreatitis? What is the thickest rate careful. of acute pancreatitis on ultrasound? 50%. Especially mild to moderate. Very often it is finding is normal. And even in some severe pancreatitis, there are ileus, ileus which lead to obscure. Uh, you cannot see the pancreas at all. So, very uh, often ultrasound has a low sensitivity to pick up acute pancreatitis. Okay, that will, you may be able to find out God's stone that may give us you some clue, but looking at the pancreas and seeing the pancreas may not be very successful. You must know that. Okay, ultrasound is an indication look for pancreas, but in such a scenario, it may not be much useful. Okay. What will be the, uh, how will there is this present on ultrasound? There is this. What will be the presentation on ultrasound? Uh, Dilated. What is Mirizis? Uh, this is uh, thorn impaction in the uh, neck of the gallbladder causing uh, objection of the bile neck. Neck of the gallbladder or which portion of Where the gallbladder? Heart mm -hmm. so, uh, so what can happen if there is a stone impacted in heart and spout? The end is the obstructive how, how does it impinge? How does it impinge on the CBD? How many types of Mirizis you know? Didi? Five. Five types. Anabra? Ma'am, four types, ma'am. According to the Sandy classification, uh, if it just if it. Okay, so just read that. Okay, so just read the types of. So these are questions that will be asked. Okay. Uh, so next slide. Next slide. So the hemogram showed the mild leukocytosis. I just go through it. Polys were 92%. Blood sugar, she's a diabetic. Creatinine normal, um, sodium electrolytes normal. Amylase was 419, lipase 584. Biochemistry shows 50-50% uh, 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 bilirubin. Um, Alkali phosphate was 157. SGOD is 238 and SGPT is 160. What's your interpretation? Trans up, trans. This question already had answered. Will you ignore that or will you give importance to this? The patient had settled. Actually, that transmeritus settles after the knee surgery, everything has settled. So, this is post after this, everything normal. Yeah. In this case, with the same pancreatitis patient, transmeritus is there. We have we should consider for Goldstone pancreatitis. Yeah, Goldstone. Goldstone related no. pancreatitis. Okay. When else will you get what What does it suggest? Rise in SGOT and SGPT in a patient with Goldstone disease. What does it suggest? One point it suggests, it suggests there's a polydopolithiasis. The very first thing, ah, even before the alkaline phosphatase rises, the first thing to rise is an AST and ALT. You should immediately give you a clue that the patient is having a polydopolithiasis. You understand? That is the clue. See, alkaline phosphatase is not that much elevated. But OTPT is elevated. SGOT and SGPT is elevated. 
Are you following? Yeah, and there's a there is an amount of light which is also increased. So, what do you think in your imagination? What do you think is happening? Probably there's a stone which is getting impacted at the ampulla. It should immediately tell you. No, I mean there's nothing to discuss on this. If only when the stone gets stuck at the ampulla, you get a pancreatitis and you get a rise in AST layer. You know, simple logic. So, what should you do at this stage? So, this is the report on day one. This was the report day before morning. So, what should I do now next? Uh, ultrasound, do you have to look for any CBD dilatation is there or not? Ultrasound just shows a gall. So what would be the level one? What would, be, what would you do in this patient? Patient is symptomatic gallstone disease. What would you do? <coughs> this is also a case where you won't be able to see the lower part of the CBD because it is CD. behind the duodenum and a lot of gas. So even if there are stones in the lower CBD, you will miss it completely. So ultrasound has so problem what investigation would you do? So what investigation will give you a clue? CT. CT. Or MRCP. MRCP. Or? Or ERCP we can go, but... Uh, ERCP, before ERCP. ERCP will not be used as a diagnostic technique. No? You, have to, you have to demonstrate the presence of stones by some technique, yes. and then only you go for yes. ERCP. ERCP is not a diagnostic test. This you should be ready. Yes, yes, yes. answering this. What are the three options? Yeah, ultrasound is insensitive to pick up this. So, what are the three options? CT, MR, MR, CP, and EOS. These are the only thing available for us to make a diagnosis. Among these, which will you prefer? That's the question. EOS. Very often, US. people may not straight away go on to EOS because EOS is invasive test and patient may be tidy with a severe pain and pancreatitis. So you can do a non-invasive investigation first and especially MR, MR, CP followed by and if there is stone then obviously you can, if there is doubt of a stone you can confirm it by EOS. Otherwise if MR, CP is very sure that there is a stone in the CBD then you can go and do ERCP straight away and remove the stone. Okay. So what, what, what I did was, I said after 24 hours, patient was stable. So after 24, I was in Goa that day, so I could not see the patient. So next day when I returned, I said, repeat the LFT. And the enzymes and all started settling down. What's your interpretation? Mm. Enzymes, you know, 267 became 180. Alpine phosphorus became 80. And durabin was 1.1. What's your interpretation? Amylase was 116. Fossil stone. Stone's fossil. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that the first thing you should come to your mind is okay, the patient is settling. So I would not push for a for a on the imaging, but maybe one imaging may be necessary because there's a suggestion of a possible stone. But definitely one thing, at least clinically, you should be able to write in the A sheet that the patient has got acute pancreatitis, but most probably a stone that is passed out. So what should you do now? How will you manage the patient? Uh, elective so next slide. No, um... So what, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. Uh, what is, describe this picture. You, what, what are the findings that you look for in ultrasound? Uh, where is that arrow? What are the arrow shows? The arrow is my, no, arrow, arrow is my. <laughs> arrow is in the correct position. So, no, Neeraj is showing the arrow. Mm. What is the, what is that? What is the finding that you look for in ultrasound? In gallstone disease? Uh, yes. Uh, one CBD you have to see CBD radiation is there. What do you see? Uh, oh. edema is okay, thickening of the gallbladder with or without edema. It is thickened, it is chronic cold state. There is edema, it is acute cold state. What is this? What is this? This black thing here. Acoustic window, no? Acoustic it's shadowing. Due to Come on, awesome. this is such a simple kindergarten case. Awesome. Oh. VT will take up simple cases. Okay, so what should you do? Next slide. Now read this. Read the read the one, uh, one two, oh, three, four. Oh, yeah, the MRCP. Read the MRC. Oh. Oh. Read the emergency, read the axial, read the coronal. What's the finding? The one, the, the one, the, the other one. This one, this one. Oh. This read one. the MRCP. Normal, abnormal. Uh, Gallbladder distended with stones in scalpel in situ. Uh, stone we're not seeing this MRCP. The first axial oh. section shows the stone. 
The first axial section shows stone. Yeah, that's the one. Those are the stones in the gallbladder. But what is the MRCP? You think it's normal or abnormal? That's what you want to know. CBD is dilated. So you want to go. So what do you want to do? Okay, just I cut short the thing. The, the MRC was normal. The, interestingly, the CV was communicating with the minor duct, you know. This was something unusual. It was not a pancreas divisive, but the distal portion of the CV was communicating with the with the minor uh, uh, pancreatic duct. Okay, that was incidental finding. There is no IHBR. See the IHBR, it's all normal. There's no yeah. IHBR dilation. That is not there. Uh, so what should you do now next? What would you since do? the since the enzymes are coming down and the pancreatic enzymes are settling, now manage the patient conservatively and we'll land an electric polycystectomy later. When? When? After within six weeks, like after four weeks. Four weeks. That's where you're wrong. Okay. The current the current teaching is uh, at the time of admission, in the same admission, proceed for a polycystectomy. That's the latest guidelines. What you are telling that, is an old criteria that where is, you wait for the pancreatitis to settle down and then mm -hmm. do it after six weeks. The mm -hmm. current thinking is that uh, why 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 we are uh, sort of hastening it? Why are we hastening and why are we not waiting for six weeks? High, high risk of repeat pancreatitis. Yes, repeat pancreatitis. Okay. So it is said that there is no extra complication or morbidity or mortality by doing it once acute pancreatitis. The main problem of acute pancreatitis is settled and during the same admission. So that's the that's way. During the same audition, you try to do a uh, uh, polycystic. So read the guidelines for that. Now, what? Go, no, go back, go back. What? Describe what is seen here. Resected specimen. What is this? Segmented zone. Mm. So this mm. question is asked in the exam. In the exam, you're supposed to be asking what was the color of the stone. Why is it important? Why is it important? What are the causes of pigment stone? Hemolysis. So, so, so first read all our South Indian papers. Read, you can read my papers. So down south, Kerala, Andhra, etc. All down southern states of the country have pigment stones. And they are non-hemolytic. Bile cultures are negative. And the bile is not lithogenic. That is most important. Because if the patient's got a cholesterol stone, chance of malignancy is high. That is why I ask this. Suppose this patient comes with polystatic on this later, then that's the time they ask what was the color of the stone. If the stone was white, then you think of lithogenic bile and you think of gallbladder cancer. So please read gallbladder uh, cancer, read epidemiology of gallstone disease across the country, read the, uh, the, the Ganges Delta, high incidence of gallbladder cancer, the color of the stones, all this you should know. Okay, and that is why medical dissolution has of no stones, uh, in South India is not very successful. Yeah, UDCA. Because, uh, these are pigment stones. They will stones. not work. Hmm. These are hmm. a situation where gold stones, uh, gold stone disease in South India will work. Hmm. For in the in the pregnancy, pregnancy de novo it forms such very short duration, very small stones, and uh, those. Uh, those may disappear with the UDCA. Most of the other stones will not disappear. Okay. That's a good point. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Quick third case. Deepthi, for you. Uh, this is a case I saw. Okay. 82-year-old uh, lady with progressive dysphagia with history of regurgitation for the past uh, three months. Loss of appetite. And she's hypertensive. It is on treatment for a peripheral neuropathy. On examination, she is obese. So examination was done in the sitting posture. I could not. What are the things you look for in examination? A patient with progressive dysphagia and age two year old. Physical examination. Quick. What are the points you look for in a patient with dysphagia who is eighty two year old on general physical examination? Simple question. Madam. I'm asking you, what will you look for in general physical examination? Pallor. You know, I, I, I will be frank, you know, with the students. You are very so. If you are so, you are answering, you have a problem. So you have to be fast, you have to be active. If you are slow, you have a problem. We are not asking about pickle, the pallor sinusis stuff. 
they are asking for something specific which is therefore dysphagia so elderly person dysphagia rule number 1 it has to be neoplasm either in the esophagus or in the cardiac that's the first thing so what are the cutaneous manifestation which may occur in a patient with a c esophagus or ca stomach or some other neoplasm okay okay So what, are, what are the what are the what are the cutaneous markers? Next. Some sign of lesser trellac, ma'am. Lymphadenopathy. We have to uh, seborrheic keratitis. Are there what what are the various cutaneous markers? Uh, ma'am, uh, the acanthosis, nigricans, uh, lymphadenopathy, ma'am. Palmar keratosis, nigricans, keratosis, 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 sign of lesser terrace. Yes. All these Lyme. are the yeah. These Sister. are all the cutaneous yes. markers of internal malignancy. And which are the lymph nodes that you will examine? Supraclavicular. Ma'am, the left supraclavicular lymph node and the uh, umbilical lymph node. Umbilical. Irish. As well as the axillary. Irish. 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 Yeah, that is important. Okay. And okay, then on examination abdomen, what will you look for? Examination the abdomen. The look again. for any masses. No, you have to look for the mass. And for trop space dullness, if there's a fundy growth, you'll have a trop space okay. dullness. It's all simple clinical markers. And in one occasion, by doing a Middleton sign, that is hooking your finger under the left costal margin, and you take a patient deep breath, you may find a mass appearing. And that again tells you there's a fundy growth. So these are the things that you look for on physical examination. Okay. So how will you proceed to investigate and manage this patient? Next slide. Can it be an ecclesia cardia? It can be secondary ecclesia. So just keep in mind that this is a progressive dysphagia, so it's more of a mechanical obstruction. So differential diagnosis will be a carcinoma. Can you locate the site of the carcinoma from the history taking? Can you locate the site of a carcinoma by history taking? BT? Speak, 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 speak. How, how do you, how do you find out? How do you find out the site of a disease from the patient history? Um, and if the patient history of regurgitation, aspiration, upper, upper and no site of disease are pointed out. out by the patient. In the G in the lower lower chest, you can tell it is the lower esophagus, but upper esophagus you cannot localize. Like a that's system. just the reverse. That's just the reverse. Murphy's law states that, you know, it's just the reverse of what you're saying. So upper third are the ones where the patient will be able to be in direct location. The lower one overlap with the upper along the myotrich plexus. So the lower one cannot be. So the person says have difficulty in swallowing and says that there's uh, stickiness in the lower end, it can still be in the upper portion. But if the location is in the upper portion and pointer, then the chances of it being at that particular site is more likely. So today, Sri Vidya, you're, everything is following a Murphy's law, you know. Whatever you're saying is just the opposite. Okay, how do you investigate? Next, in the choice of investigation. So she is, she's a cardiac oh, patient. Yeah. So we yeah. asked for a cardiac fitness and we proceeded with an endoscopy. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Deeraj. Slide not moving. Deeraj. Okay, it's slide. not moving. Endoscopy showed no ulcerative uh, proliferative neoplasm of the G junction. No? That was the finding. Yeah, G junction. Biopsy showed uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Is, so it what a, is, it, it? is it unusual or usual? G junction tumor to have squamous carcinoma. Yeah. Just go back, go back and show the growth. Uh, that's the one. So the growth was starting at the OG junction and on retrofection it was extending along the lesser curve. So what do you think? What do you think is carcinoma? Big thing. Uh, Adenocarcinoma usually occurs in lower esophagus. No, no, yeah. This patient has a cancer of the lower esophagus, G junction, and into the uh, proximal stomach. So, what do you think is? Is it is it uh, CA stomach or is it a uh, CA uh, or the cardia? If it is less than five centimeters, G junction. Uh, is it? What is the classification? Just tell us what is your classification. You heard uh, of the classification? Uh, Srividya, you know uh, Seward's classification? Seward's classification. Sir, ma'am, the tumor extending less than 2 cm above the Z line. It, uh, type 3 types are there, ma'am. 
for the sievert classification yes, uh, yes. Well, then, uh, sievert 1 is up to 5.5 cm to 1 cm in the lower esophagus and uh, sievert 2 is no uh, see sievert 1 2 and 3 so from uh, g junction 1 cm above up to 5 cm is sievert 1 from g junction 1 cm above g junction and 2 cm below that is into the stomach is sievert 2 and beyond 2 cm is uh, sievert Three. Okay, that's the classification because no, is it is right. the relevance of that. Apart from giving a classification, does it have any relevance? Any relevance that's for the classification? What's the importance? Because C what so, three is considered as a CS tumor, and it is managed exactly like a CS tumor. Okay, it's not considered as a CS tumor. It's like a CS tumor, and they are managed like a total radical gastrectomy and related procedures. So the biopsy gave mass characterizing squamous cell carcinoma. So how should you manage this 82 year old lady? What are the, just tell me, just tell me what are the treatment options available for managing or management of squamous cell carcinoma? What is the reason, uh, what is the performance okay, status Okay, next slide. Performance stage is very good. She wants to eat. Any investigations you want? Good. Endoscopy and biopsy are available. Any further investigation you want, Dr. Deepi? Deepi, you are working in Amala Cancer Institute. That was the original name of the institute, and there's a cancer center attached to it. And you must be seeing more cases of CA than most of the other DNP candidates, no? Because you have a cancer center attached. So you must be very confident about cancer. If people come to know that you are coming from Amala, uh, they will be asking you all questions about cancer. Because you are supposed to know cancer very well, because you are seeing these cases day in and day out. Okay, so what? That further investigations. Pardon? PET scan. I think you don't do PET scan straight away. I think you have to do CT of the chest and abdomen. Why do you CT of the abdomen? Not metastasis. Metastasis is where? Liver. 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 Anywhere, anywhere else? What is the lymphatic drainage of esophagus? And where all this uh, uh, spread can occur? This is a standard question expected in a CI esophagus. This is a standard question. Where, what is the lymphatic drainage of esophagus? And they'll ask you to draw. Okay. Draw this. Okay. You so, must the, the peri, peri all, all throughout it is peri esophageal agreed even after the, the cervical esophagus in the cervical lymph node paratracheal and para esophageal lymph nodes okay then the problem is that it gets drained into the up to the celiac lymph node so up to celiac so pernic lymph nodes and celiac lymph nodes are considered as the local lymph nodes for esophagus remember exactly so when surgery is done when a surgery is done they have to uh, remove up to celiac lymph nodes Okay, minimum 16 lymph nodes have to be removed in a radical surgery. So they have to, even if it is low reservagus, they have to do, uh, remove the celiac, up to celiac lymph nodes. So that is the relevance of that. Okay, now second question is that, suppose you have got a CA or the upper one third, can it metastasize to celiac lymph nodes? Anabra? Ma'am, sir, then it will be a distant metastasis. Sir. It can metastasize, but, but it will be treated as a stage 3 or stage 4. Yeah, so it differs. Uh, 4, sir. So, uh, so uh, the, in the middle, the lower and upper, it, it differs. So you have to know that difference. Okay, you have to know that difference. So how would you? What are the treatment options? And so then, this patient had a PET CT, and there was there was no metastasis anywhere. It was an isolated lesion at the OG junction. What should you do? Isolated ulcerative nodular growth, astriding the esophagus and the stomach, just in the distal end. So what? 82 year old, what should you do? What, just, just tell us the list of treatment options for a squamous cell carcinoma. So, this is resectable or unresectable, Deepthi? Yes, yes. Resectable. Resectable. So, carcinoma of the esophagus, carcinoma of the stomach, first priority is whether we can do a radical resectable. Okay. Now, to improve the outcome, you have to, you may have to give, what you've given in a hospital, you must have seen many cases. So you straight away take every patient to the theater or do you do something else? Some other therapy? Pre-op chemotherapy. Pre-op chemotherapy or so radiotherapy. Okay, so adjuvant pre-op chemo radiotherapy. Okay, 
there are many people who don't do their radiotherapy but there are many people who uh, compulsorily give uh, chemotherapy for squamous carcinoma and then uh, downstage it or uh, uh, reduce the bulk of the tumor what is the epicenter of the tumor actually schwartz classification says the epicenter of the tumor will have to be within this distance what is the epicenter <laughs> Epicenter is the place where maximum bulk of the tumor. The maximum bulk of the tumor is the epicenter of the tumor. So you okay. have to do a pre op you have to refer to studies pre op chemo radiation. What are the medicines used? Isluroyo. For squamous carcinoma? For DT. Hmm? Five. Infusional IFU or neoparticaxel or the neoparticaxel. Okay. And it is different. Another thing for adenocarcinoma, you have got the newer drugs, highly, highly specific newer drugs which are there, which are more, more uh, uh, in newer drugs. So you have to know the name of the new drug for adenocarcinoma, but for chemos carcinoma, mostly it is the old drugs, same plus radiotherapy. Okay, suppose after radiotherapy and chemotherapy, the tumor disappears and on endoscopy, on CT, you don't find any tumor. What will be your approach? Will you leave it alone or will you surgery? This is a controversial issue, but general suggestion is that you have to do surgery. Okay, general suggestion is that. Whereas some people say wait and watch, but general opinion is that you will have to do surgery. You know the extent of the lesion from the initial CT and the endoscopy and also accordingly you do a radical resection. Okay, but remember always have a 5 centimeter clearance in the esophagus and a good clearance in the stomach. And if there is extension into the stomach, they almost do total gastrectomy or uh, partial radical gastrectomy with a lymph node dissection. So, uh, what, I, what I want to mention is this, you know, today chemo and RT are making a major impact both in the upper end and in the lower end. Even for CA rectum, the first level of management is a chemo RT. And it seems that it just melts, the, the, the chemotherapy agents are so powerful, the tumor just melts and disappears, followed by an RT, and then go for a radical resection. Just see how it behaves. No, the upper end and lower end are behaving. Just have ecclesia cardia there, your Hirschsprung's disease is side. You have uh, uh, carcinoma, esophagus, that's why squamous cell, you have adenocarcinoma, but the treatment approach is just the same, the upper and lower end. <laughs> it's easy to remember. So chemo, please read chemo RT. That is most important management in both CA rectum as well as in CA esophagus, especially the squamous cell carcinoma, including adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma, more specific agents are available. Yeah, myocarcinoma are newer, more agents. specific agents yeah. which are more useful. And it has to be concurrent chemotherapy. It is not sequential. Concurrent chemotherapy and radiotherapy together. There are different regimes, there are different names for the various trials. Uh, just note it down. And I think you have uptodate.com actually gives a very detailed description about all these things. It has been last updated in the la May, in the March last week. So it is a very up to date thing. So you all uh, refer to uptodate.com for the current management. You get all the details, all the newer drugs, everything. And up to date, uh, any, any other thing is that you can click the link and you will reach the, uh, another area also easily. Now, okay. one, one so, question is before we just conclude um, is there a role for EOS in this patient? What will be the TNN classification in this patient? Anandra? T1A, ma'am. Ma ma in this patient? Uh, in this may, patient. Yeah, it, it uh, may. It, so, so it, it, it is unlikely to be 4A, 4B. Uh, no? Yes, ma'am. 4B. It, it may be 3. So, EOS uh, will yes, help. What's the role? Can you do an endoscopic uh, uh, dissection? Uh, Some uh, mucosal yes, dissection. If it T1 is T1 less B. than T1B uh, involving yeah. SM1, SM2, mm -hmm. then we can go ahead with ESE. Or... ESE yeah. So, therefore, read all of, you know, like PDT, photodynamic therapy, then you have the RFA ablation therapy, then you have the cryotherapy, and then you have the yes. EU, um, ESD. There are four, especially in patients who have just mucosal and submucosal, oh. these are the ones. Once it goes to submucosal, then it gets tethered. Then you cannot do the ESD. That's the time when you go for a chemo RT. So please read the TNM classification, know the lymphatic drainage, know how to draw the lymphatic drainage, what, what the, Dr. BT mentioned, uh, absolutely, these are the questions that are asked in DNB. That's why we, what I thought today would be just a quick 
coverage of three or four cases so that you have a quick, you know, they're all bedside clinics. Patient is there in front of you, what do you do, how do you manage, and what investigations would you do? Okay, more than the history taking. History taking, there's nothing much, no, in all these patients. They're all straightforward cases. Uh, dysphagia very often is given as ward rounds case, no? Because in ward rounds case, ward round. dysphagia. Either you can have a stricture is a virus or a CA is a virus, uh, post treatment stricture or a echography like, stricture. So, what, uh, what usually for ward rounds? Okay. So, I think we TV, I think I feel happy that we did four cases today, fast round. We finished on time, 9 35, and all the cases were good. So, we had one polystatic jaundice where we learned that CMV which, I mean, I really have never seen one. So CNV, HSV as one of the differentials, including EV as one of the causes for polystatic. And it was nice, it was heartening to hear that the patient did so well after the treatment. I think that is most encouraging. That's most encouraging. Yeah, yeah that is, a, that's the one plus thing about antiviral treatment uh, yeah. in patients with ALF and ACLF. And if you correctly diagnose and treat, you can actually cure them of the problem. And we don't have exactly. to do liver transplantation. That's a, that's a plus point. And they took a the call on taking a liver biopsy. And I think the lead for a liver biopsy to me was rise in alkalophosphatase. You know, but alkaline phosphatase was something that was intriguing, telling, is it granulomatous, is it? So we had a patient recently where the alphos was 264 and gamma GT was 364 in a patient with ascites. So again, we went in the direction and CT showed huge HCC. Okay. So, HCC can present the rays, alphas and gamma GD, including other conditions. So, that was an interesting case. And then you, I, this is probably one of the few times I've picked up a case of secondary bacterial peritonitis. We keep reading about it. We keep reading of the polymicrobial characteristics. So, this was a, a case that I saw the case in ICU. And I thought, oh, this, you should know the quick approach to a patient like this. And gallstone pancreatitis, look at the number of mistakes you people made. Simple case, straightforward case, Murphy sign, Murphy is this thing, what is the clinical presentation, all the basics you read. And the last case is a classical case of dysphagia. So I thought today we just went on a fast mode round. Please read in and around all these four topics. They're all cases that are kept in the exam. So if you know the pre conditions of the survivors which can lead to cancer and the change in the trend, the change in the trend, the lower one said in India and Asia still famous carcinoma, but there's an increasing trend of change. The time trends have changed the carcinoma from Adenomas to Adeno in the lower one there. Okay, especially in the Western countries, we should know the time trends that you should know. And the eradication of the H. pylori, they're doing more harm than doing good. That trend also you should know. The eradication of H. pylori, there's, yeah, there's appearance more of an adenocarcinoma. Okay. Okay. And I'm finally, sir, endotherapy for uh, CA cervagus, both uh, uh, therapeutic as well as palliative. I mean, therapeutic, and I meant uh, treatment wise. A radical treatment you can give complete treatment curated treatment yes curated treatment in small tumors uh, superficial tumors and for advanced tumors uh, various forms of endotherapy are available laser various coagulation plus tending you should not forget don't, about don't forget tending, tending yeah. Because, yes because that is the most thing which is most commonly done various forms of tending uh, mm -hmm. how do you decide the size of mm -hmm. this tent uh, whether you use uh, uh, covered uncovered stent all those questions will come okay. only thing this was lower Sometimes third. the patient may yeah. have the tea. TOF, the patient may have tracheal fistula, I will ask you how you manage all those things. Okay. So you have to read all those things. So please, yeah, just cover up. Yeah, read up all these things that we have discussed today in and around. No, just read up, cover cover up and finish up all these things. And don't forget to attend the gym. Gym, gym. Yeah, gym, gym. Gym, yeah. As the last week. Gym, GYM, gym is 29, 30 and first. Okay. You forget first, about other all, all other things and gym because you will be exposed to many examiners. You will be exposed to your, your colleagues also. You will know where you stand. Without us telling, you will know where you stand. A new person. Okay. So, it's, so please attend. Thank you, Vicky. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Good night. Thank you. All of you have done well. Don't lose heart. Yeah. Just keep reading. Just keep reading.